Welcome everybody to this uh, last Washington History Seminar for the uh, spring of 2011. I'm Christian Osterman. Very happy to welcome all of you here. Also on behalf of uh, my co-chair, Roger Lewis, who of course directs the National History Center, which is the Wilson Center's partner in organizing this series, which focuses on historical perspectives on international and national affairs. We're, we have the privilege today uh, of having with us um, Professor Paul Landau with a talk on South Africa and the end of apartheid. I'll uh, introduce him in a minute uh, and also give uh, uh, Roger a chance to uh, 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 say whatever he would like at the outset. Uh, but I wanted to uh, 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 just remind everybody that this series is being sponsored by the Society of Historians of American Foreign Relations. And we're very grateful to Schaefer's support for the series. And we're also grateful, respectively, Roger and I, uh, or jointly, actually, uh, to our staff, in this case, Christina Tertsieva on my side, and Miriam uh, House Cunningham um, on the side of the National History Center. And I want to extend a very special thank you to Miriam, who uh, really has been uh, phenomenally uh, helpful in putting the series together and getting word out to all of you and many folks beyond uh, those that are in this room. It's been a driving force at the National History Centers. And as the assistant director there, her tenure there is coming to an end. And so this will be Miriam's last uh, Washington History Seminar that she will curate from uh, the uh, center's end. We hope that she will be participating and attending in the future, but I thought we also, we, we should recognize her efforts and give her a big round of applause. So Miriam, all the, all the best uh, for your future pursuits. We hope uh, that uh, uh, you'll find your, bay w your way back here to the center and to the National History Center on many occasions. With that, let me briefly introduce our guest speaker for today. Uh, Professor Londo is a historian of Southern African culture and politics, received his PhD from the University of Wisconsin. He's currently an associate professor of history at the University of Maryland, former colleague of my colleague here, Sonia Michel, who probably should have been sharing this session as a former colleague uh, um, uh, uh, f that features a former colleague. Previously, Lando taught at Yale University and at the University of New Hampshire. He's written extensively on medical practice, on imager imagery and evangelism, on narration and religious experience, and on the history of photography in Africa. His first book, The Realm of the World, Word. of the Word, uh, Language, Gender, and Christianity in a Southern African Kingdom, was shortlisted for the Herzkowitz Prize for Best Work in African Studies in 1995. He's the co-editor and co-author of Images and Empires, Visuality in Colonial and Postcolonial Africa, a collection of essays about visual representations between Africans and Europeans. He's also the author of the last chapter of the recent Cambridge History of South Africa. More recently, he uh, has authored Popular Politics in the History of South Africa, 1400 to 1948, uh, also with Cambridge University Press. And he's currently beginning work about the turn to violence in the 1960s in the history of the struggle against apartheid. It's a great pleasure to have you with us and uh, give you the floor, but not before I call on my co-chair, Roger. Uh, I'd like just to reemphasize what Christian said about Miriam House Cunningham. Uh, none of this would take place on such a successful, in such a successful way were it not for uh, Miriam. Uh, we have been conducting this seminar now for three semesters, but this is the first opportunity that we've had to talk specifically about South Africa. Uh, I would like to go around the table and uh, let everyone just introduce themselves in whatever way you would like. 
Uh, David, I suppose you would regard yourself as the eminence grease at the State Department. Is that one way of describing <laughs> yourself? I, oh. I don't know about that, but I, I, I'm David Nichols. Hold on, hold on. Wait, wait for the mic. Yeah, David Nichols at the Office of the Historian at the Department of State. Without further elaboration. Um, yes, I think so. <laughs> Arnita Jones, historian, retired, sort of. Tom Mitchell. Sonia Michelle, Paul Landau's former colleague. <laughs> David Wright, I'm an economic historian and uh, a fellow at the uh, Wilson Center this year. <laughs> James Sang, retired physicist. Carol Sang, historian. Christina Terzi, a program assistant for the History and Public Policy Program. Uh, James Enretta. Uh, historian. I was Pinot intern. Uh, Ron Steele, historian and uh, Wilson Fellow. Ludger Kühnert, currently a, a fellow visiting here from Germany. I taught a course in South Africa some 20 years back. David Kaivig, historian and former Wilson Fellow. Landis Jones, uh, Professor Emeritus of Political Science. Uh, Steve Lipson, uh, I'll be starting at Vanderbilt's PhD program in the fall, so this sadly might also be my last history seminar in DC. Uh, Jim Grossman, American Historical Association. Emily Landau, historian and wife of Paul. <laughs> Andrew Zimmerman from George Washington University. <laughs> I'm Emily Malkin. I'm a program assistant in the U.S. Studies program here at the Wilson Center. Don Wolfensberger, director of the Congress Project here at the Wilson Center. And Miriam House Cunningham of the National History Center. Uh, Paul Landau on uh, South Africa and the end of apartheid. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you all for being here. Thank you to Miriam and... Thank you to Mr. Osserman, uh, or, or Dr. Christian. Uh, Christian. It's just fine. And, uh, and to uh, uh, William Roger Lewis, uh, it's a great honor to be here. <clears throat> when F.W. de Klerk let Nelson Mandela out of prison in February of 1990, Mandela made a brief speech. The man, now called uh, Madiba, in South Africa, addressed a crowd in Cape Town which was captured on film and with subtitles. The legal ownership of the tape recording, by the way, is apparently now in dispute because the British say that the work that they did in restoring it from a dictaphone tape gives them copyright. Um, you can go online because of that and see a bad uh, and blurry version of this and hear uh, Mandela's high distinctive voice. Um, here he is burning his pass in 1960. Um, I've uh, taken this image from Defiant Images, um, a book of photographs. No one knew what he looked like, of course, in 1990, um, since his uh, photo uh, had not been published for many, many years. It was illegal in South Africa to actually publish his picture. Um, and Mandela's later prominence, and in fact his presidency, derives directly from the fact that he was the head of a particular wing of the African National Congress, the movement that uh, became a party and now runs South Africa. And that wing was called MK, or Mkonto Esizwe, the Spear of the Nation. And it's his association with the turn to violence against the South African state which later guaranteed his prominence. In fact, he trained briefly with uh, Soviet-sponsored revolutionary armies in Africa, and um, he was arrested in 1963 with scores of other prominent South Africans, and he spent the next 27 years in jail. The apartheid government had also not permitted legal quotations of him to be circulated, so he was historically rendered a kind of non-person, and periodically the press would publish a blank space where a photograph or image would have been of him, and they would do this with other banned people as well. So his appearance was a matter of conjecture, 
And he came out, a gray-haired man. I don't have the, uh, the grainy image just to show you. And no one knew what he might say. But I must say already, even before he spoke, his existence seemed to say, Mandela, you've suffered so much for us while we did nothing, while we didn't force them to let you out of prison sooner. So he kind of was, in a sense, a living rebuke to the rest of humanity. And we, in a sense, I think, wanted him to forgive us. So he was listened to. And he came out and he at once said, quite aware of the lingo of the young lions of the township, Amanda means power. And he was greeted uh, with the refrain, Awe tu is ours. Power is ours. Perfectly natural. Mandela next said, uh, sorry, Mandela next said, um, Awe tu or Ngawe tu, it's not clear from the recording, both correct, which in turn received Amandla again as this pairing is ours, power, power is ours. But then Mandela said, Maibuye, let it return to us. And the crowd said, sl with slightly less certainty this time, again, Amandla. But this was not correct. Uh, Maibuye was part of a separate pairing, which the crowd, younger than Mandela by decades, did not know. And the proper response was given by Mandela without missing a beat, uh, which was, e Africa. Let it return to us, Africa. And the crowd, reminded of this lost pairing, uh, when uh, Mandela said, e Africa, said, Maibuye, finally. Let it return to us. And so what I propose is to think critically for a moment about what kind of Africa was being called forth to return in South Africa at that moment. Um, and I'm going to suggest various kinds of constraints and dynamics. And ultimately, I'm going to entertain the possibility that it might be a tribal Africa. And then I'm going to argue that, in fact, it will not be a tribal Africa that is called back. Now, the 1994 elections that ushered in a free South Africa were certainly historic, and we remember them well. And, and me and Emily have a framed uh, ballot um, from the election hanging in our foyer. But we Africanists also associate 1994 with the climax of the genocidal killing of Tutsis in Rwanda by the Hutu majority's government uh, citizen militias. This was during the Rwandan Patriotic Front's invasion, which began in 1990. And so 1994 is associated with the beginnings of the Eastern Congo World War, a war that's now taken uh, somewhere between five and six million lives. Now, I know these two processes, the move to democracy in South Africa and the explosion of ethnic hatred in East Central Africa, seem so far apart that I know for many of you it seems even in bad taste to mention them together. But I'm not the first. Mahmoud Mamdani articulated it before me, ladies and gentlemen. So in both parts of the continent, the policy of indigeneity, of chiefs having autonomous domains of power, and of only generations old locals with residential rights having rights, only the tribe in a particular place, in other words, having rights, that that's left difficult legacies behind in both Eastern Congo in both Rwanda and in South Africa. Nor is there any other modality for direct local representation in post-apartheid South Africa, let me say. Party lists of candidates are sent out on the national level, and this has left rural constituencies, especially those men whose roots are outside their work zone and who don't live in the area, who live in an area where they're not, quote, from, it's left them without any real representation from the ground up in the ruling party in the African National Congress. Now, ethnic belonging was a part of apartheid theory, and it was a part of the administrative structure of the Belgian Congo. So both under apartheid and under the genocide and genocidal regimes in Burundi in 1973, in the Kivus in 1981, and then the genocide in 1994, 
there's this problem. There's a backdating of ethnic belonging. There's an understanding of ethnicity and tribe as establishing citizenship. And even today, one reads of the 12 South African tribes as if there are such things that have always existed. No one can name what 12 they were uh, for longer than the period, uh, than a recent period, since the, that number is somewhat spurious. And there's also the native Hutu and the interloper Tutsi in, uh, in, in Rwanda. So in both cases, this is a distortion. Um, there are no stable tribes, and Tutsi and Hutu come from a mixture and hierarchization of mixed farmers and herders, all speaking the same language. Notions of tribal authenticity produced a disaster in South Africa up to the overthrow of white racist rule and helped produce a bigger disaster, again according to Mamdani, in the eastern Congo. Tribalism which can affect the fortunes of young people hoping to go to university or make husbands murder their wives and incinerate buildings is what I'm talking about. And we need only look around and take in Uganda's wars and Kenya's near war to think it fair to ask whether tribalism is the future for South Africa too. So when Mandela asked, let it return to us, is this the Africa that was envisioned? Is the inter-ethnic harmony established in the inner councils of the African National Congress and based in its illustrious elite institutional history really a good guide for predicting the future among the masses in South Africa? And when I ask this question, it's important to understand that historians of South Africa understand the African past very often as essentially a story of custom and ritual among types of people or ethnic groups even though Africanists outside of South Africa do not and have downplayed ethnic identity as a determinant of social life in recent scholarship. So it might seem reasonable to suppose that tribes could dominate politics in South Africa even more than they have in mo almost any other post-colonial state if tribalism lies right below the surface ready to reappear from the ancient ways in the past and from the system that was established by the apartheid government. And I'm also asking this question as a disappointed long-term supporter of the African National Congress, slightly disappointed in the inability of the government to make a substantial dent in providing housing for the masses of immigrants to the cities and towns, more disappointed in the levels of cronyism and the violations of due process in investigating corruption, and seriously disappointed in the recent efforts of the African National Congress to deep six parts of the historical archives in a misguided effort to control the writing of their own history in the run-up to the 100th anniversary of the party. We might add, since WikiLeaks has exposed this, that in many countries, if it turned out that the leader of the government had a direct role in founding an opposition party on the sly and secretly helped write the charter of that opposition party, that this would be big news. If it then turned out that the people who had joined this party, and I refer to COPE, the opposition party in South Africa, had to leave the party and rejoin the ANC or the dominant party elsewhere to get business contracts and loans, that would also be big news. But not in South Africa. That's just business as usual now. Now the ANC as an organization, as many may know, got started as an elite Congress probably modeled after the Indian Congress in South Africa. In 1912, it, it formed to oppose the delivery of the country to white people following the South African War. And for years after that, the ANC was a small organization with a few hundred card-carrying members in the whole of the country. I just recently saw the statistic, and I, I hope I'm getting it right, so I haven't written it down, that right, right at World War II in 1940, there were less than 5,000 members of the ANC. So this was not really a mass party in the first part of the century. And among the rural masses in the first part of the century, African peasant farmers, there were many mobilizations setting themselves against the state. It had nothing to do with the ANC. Some of these were restorationist, but they favored the resituation of some historic chiefship on reclaimed land. And they did not 
embrace ethnicity. Many of them insisted on a policy of open application to pledge allegiance to a successful chief and the restoration of that policy as a tradition, going against the idea of belonging in a narrow way. Political agitators also borrowed American ideas or ideas about America in order to mobilize in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. Black Americans were very early on in South African politics a source of organizational ideas because they took power or seemed to take power or prominence at any rate as black people, not as this or that chiefdom. And among some people it was said that black American pilots were coming to South Africa to drive the Boers, the Dutch, into the sea. And that those farm workers who held red cards showing an affiliation with the International Commercial Workers Union would be protected by black American pilots' bombs. They wouldn't hit them. This organization, really a supersized dock workers' union, ended up having tens of thousands and even potentially over 100,000 members in South Africa. This was a salvational movement. The elect will be saved. And in some, in some ways, it, it, uh, it was a religious movement as well as a political movement. The state discouraged it, discouraged tribalism, discouraged anything having to do with rural organization, and eventually crushed the, the, uh, the ICU, the International Commercial Workers Union. But I'll just point out that as a movement, it was not tribal. It was, again, multi-ethnic. It again attempted to, to, uh, to bring people together who had no tribal or ethnic affiliation. And in that sense, it was quite traditional, I'll argue, in a moment. Because African chiefdoms long had amalgamation as a central strength, not exclusivity. Um, amalgamation very often of unrelated factions into the heart of chiefdom and into the heart of its central town precincts. And the rankings of men in a generally accepted way, in a ritual, circumcision, that would make everybody understand their place in things. Participatory general assemblies were not limited to people of certain blood descent, but were open to everybody living in that area. And people in peacetime tolerated overlapping statuses and disagreements where men would rank themselves according to genealogies which sometimes did not agree with each other, if there hadn't been a circumcision recently, especially, to clarify things. In war, these men might uproot themselves and form new alliances, leaving villages full of women and children behind them and settle elsewhere where they would have to reestablish new genealogical relations to each other. Men could claim statuses and uh, circulate those statuses, but very often those statuses were, as you see here on the screen, I'm a person of past chief N, whoever that would be, the Ba Monaheng, Ba Moshwe Shwe, the Ba Kama. These were terms that meant I am a person of a certain chief. They were taken, however, as being tribal designations so that the Ba Monaheng were the Monaheng people, and that was an ethnic uh, designation. But in fact, uh, that is not the case. And many of these chiefdoms were not purely patrilineal inheritances. Many of them had chiefs who had uh, interrupted patrilineal inheritance with a form of rude meritocracy and had uh, taken power. Um, Sometimes they could be of uh, past place. I'm a, a, a Baharutsi, a Barolong, Batlaping. These are, these are locatives, so they're places um, as an affiliation. And sometimes you've got situations where people identify themselves with regard to their neighbors as the junior or the senior, the right hand, the left hand, the great or the small. And these designations were also taken later on to be ethnic groups. This is a picture of the South African Highfeld in relation to the Zimbabwean highlands. And 
uh, it's an unusual map. It's actually hard to find uh, a map that'll combine these two things because normally Zimbabwe and Zimbabwe's history is treated as entirely separate from South Africa's where Zimbabwe's history is a matter of dynasties and sophisticated politics and South Africa's history is a matter of tribes and simple cattle keeping people. And I fashioned this map to show that the area of settlement is roughly contiguous over time um, and that everybody within the uh, general southern African area speak related languages, the S group Bantu languages, and share uh, a political history with one another once we get away from this tribal dynamic that I'm arguing against. And here's a, a, a map of the high felt uh, that I've uh, supplied from my own book here. And I'm going to use this to illustrate with some historical examples how tribe never fully encapsulated or explained uh, what was going on. This area, the Highfeld, uh, bounded by that line that you see of uh, 1,000 meters, was a great place to settle from the 1300s and 1400s on, with very little disease. But I'm going to talk about briefly the 19th century to illustrate a point, and then I'll move back again to more recent times. When an American missionary, Francis Owen, went scouting for a place to build a church, he had to deal with both Africans and Boers, and he found that the Boers in this area here, right up here, had been trying to create the local people as a tribe. They wanted to limit where they could settle. They wanted to limit the settlement to only people who were called Bahurutsi, and no one else could join them. And what he found was that this was not possible because, in his words, the Bahurutsi had formed connection with various chiefs around about them where they lived, notably chiefs Mahura and Mashoe, which you see here in this uh, shape. And so because of that, uh, the Barutsi could not move without the advice and consent of other chiefs. In addition, one could add this shape, which linked by alliance the so-called uh, Griqua, or mixed race people, in the bottom of that V, with Moshaneng to the north and Motito also to the north in an alliance which bound these people together over racial boundaries and uh, uh, over space. And finally, uh, because the, uh, 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 of, uh, uh, of further alliances, the people called uh, Bata Ping were allied to the Griqua domain and to other mixed race people and uh, other Africans along the um, uh, Fall River uh, there, as you see. Now, none of these look like tribal groups, these uh, shapes, and, and that's the point. I'm, I'm getting away from the idea of uh, tribes as billiard balls knocking into each other here. One could also uh, recognize a set of processes having to do with uh, uh, two large associations, Bahrutsi and Barolong, which covered wide parts of the Haifel. This is most of South Africa that you're looking at, so this is a, a, a big uh, area. But just to restore our shapes for a moment um, and, and uh, add three more big blotches, one can talk about the Basutu in what is today Lesotho, that's the bottom shape, the, the gold shape there, which is today counted as one of the core South African ethnic groups, but what, which was not at first a tribe at all. Uh, King Meshweshe, or Chief Meshweshe, usurped his genealogical senior, a kingmaker named Maketa, and he collaborated with other chiefs and uh, created the Basutu, created it out of people who are local to the area and people who are not, brought in uh, so-called uh, Khoi Khoi, Khoi-speaking people, as well as Zulu-related people 
uh, from the east. And in fact, the origin of the word Basutu simply meant mountain people or uh, literally buckled garbed ones because they wore buckles or ties around woolen blankets to keep warm. The same is true for the Pedi kingdom based in the Steelport River, the, the purple shape. Um, this kingdom drew on Cape people, uh, uh, Nguni-speaking migrants, migrants from the West, and even some escaped slaves from the Cape Colony to create its domain. And then lastly, the, the brown splotch actually uh, uh, should appear before the example I gave with the Reverend Owens as the Indibeli Kingdom, the famous Indibeli Kingdom, very often portrayed as an invading population subordinating those around it. But as Norman Etherington in his recent piece in the American Historical Review on Barbarians notes, at most one had three, four hundred men moving from one area to another, not a whole tribe of people. Um, so a gendered perspective, shall we say, changes the uh, understanding of what's going on with the founding of this uh, kingdom. And their population expanded by incorporating people who are already living there, so that the majority language in the Indibeli kingdom was actually the language of the Highfeld, Setswana. It was not uh, the Zulu uh, language of their origin, which was only spoken by uh, aristocrats. In fact, the very word in Debele, Aman Debele, is just a regional pronunciation of the phrase Ma Tebele, the people of Chief Tebele. But unlike many designations, the people of Chief Tebele refers to oral tradition in which Tebele is paired with a junior brother, Tebeane. And so this is an indigenous categorization which means people of the senior court or invaders, people who are coming in to lord it over us. And that's what Tebele actually means. So people lived on the land in various ways with alliances and connections and rankings. And there are no clear tribes uh, from the early uh, encounters. Um, there are uh, instead uh, fraternal courts uh, alliances, and people who claim to be of junior status to others who are not present, as in the examples that I've given before. Um, north of the Malopo River, there were Bushmen who spoke Quay, not a sand language, working as servants or slaves. But on the Orange River, Africans speaking the majority Bantu language were often impoverished and herded for Quay speakers who, were, who deprecated them as Bushmen. So to put this into simpler formation, whether or not you were the black African Bantu speaker or the Bushman-looking uh, herder, your status was determined locally by the relationships and the climate at the time. It wasn't determined by your race. This word, Bichwana, uh that I'm using, I use because it's a, a, a word which does not mean the same thing as Botswana. It, it, it's a word which covers the speech of people on the Highfeld, including Sasutu, Setswana, Sepedi, and other regional dialects today. Um, so tribe was not a mode that carried people's state building aims very well, but surprisingly, Christianity was. And most incipient political organizations in the 19th century made use of Christian language and Christian forms of expression. And many people also called to one another as Christians. And it turns out that this is true for the black consciousness movement as well in the 1970s, according to a new book by Daniel Magaziner. The black consciousness movement was influenced by black theology and other worldwide uh, Christian trends. Now, I want to just talk for a moment about the strange overlap between religion and politics. This is my book, by the way, where this, this material comes from. The strange overlap between uh, Christianity and politics, and basically it went like this. You might understand this, these two triangles as two separate domains. The domain on the left of politics, the domain on the right of Christendom. The, the, uh, uh, the domain of heaven and the afterlife and the kingdom of God and the millennium. 
but to the left is the actual political and chiefly allegiances of ordinary people in real life. And as missionaries looked for words to communicate their message, uh, they wanted to find a way to communicate God. And at the head of the political pyramid is <clears throat> an ancestor, an ancestral chief. As I said, people identify themselves as people of a chief. And that is, in fact, an ancestor. And obviously, at the head of the Christian edifice is God. But missionaries use the word ancestor to translate God. And so ultimately, there was the same figure at the top of both hierarchies of power. The figure given in one language as God and another language as ancestor, but actually by the people simply expressed as mudimo. Um, sorry for my uh, writing there, but uh, 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 it didn't turn out quite the way I wanted. But the point I'm trying to make here is that the time of the past at the head of the pyramid, the head of the pyramid was in a different era. It was history for the political triangle. It was an ancient time. It was the great, great era, as people said. But for missionaries, this was the Bible time, the era from which the second coming would arise, but also it was the great, great time, the great, great era. They used the same words to translate the historical font of power in life and the historical font, the font of power in religion. So it could be thought that the missionaries simply formed their Christian edifice out of the political edifice in this sort of a Durkheimian view. But I want to suggest something a little bit uh, uh, different uh, because, in fact, because people did not actually live in real inherited tribes over the long term, they came together and they reimagined their ancestry as part of a single genealogical story, agreeing to a hegemonic version of the succession. So they had in their minds these different pyramids of origin, and then they created an ideal, same, single origin and font of power for themselves. And so, in a sense, this then was copied and gave shape to Christian churches and the domain of God. But there's also the perspective of process. For it was only, in fact, when those landed, real political formations on the left were broken up and dissolved that people became Christians en masse, moving away from the political designation when the land was taken away from their chiefships and migrating to the Christian designation. I've added that little uh, cross there. So the, use, the new use of old political language in church was something that, that distinguished Christianity in South Africa from a long time ago. And when popular assemblies for political rallies were made illegal in 1927 in South Africa, churches were the only forum where people could still use the same language and could still congregate in large groups legally. Christian language, Christian churches became a major mode of organization. I'll talk about that image in a moment, but, but so the alternative uh, 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 to the tribal view here is, is that people lived sovereign lives on the land in a complex network of open chief and ancestor-based formations involving unequal alliances. And some rural people kept fighting for this mode of being well into the 20th century in a period where nobody understood their past as anything but tribal. William Beinart, the Oxford historian, has shown that the famous Pondoland uprising had its roots in colonial extensions of land use policies where the state intervened in people's relationship with the land, telling people how to uh, ward off locusts and how to dip their cattle and, and so on. So the chiefship split apart and apartheid recognized one, but the bypassed and legitimate chief continued in Pondoland. And over time, after more 
violence and, and more attempts of surveyors to survey the land uh, and uh, debates about who owned the forests and the land, a rebellion broke out in 1960. And this rebellion mobilized men in defense of the uh, legitimate chief. So even here, where one could arguably say there's a tribal revolt in Pondaland, what there really is is a revolt against uh, the state taking charge of the land and removing political formation's direct relationship to it. Now, during the Pondaland uprising, from deep in the legal offices of Mandela, Sisulu, and, and, uh, and others in the ANC, uh, Govan Mbeki was sent on a mission, father of now former President Thabo Mbeki. He was dispatched to investigate rural South Africa. And he went to um, uh, the Tembu Chiefdom and, and Mpondaland. Um, and he wrote a book about the Mpondaland uprising where he argued that essentially it was a war against a restricted form of tribalism. And he credited his understanding to this, that the rural areas were ahead of the urban African National Congress in their eagerness to use direct action and violence, and that the ANC had better play catch up. In the end, the ANC's old guard were convinced that a new military wing, MK, would have no evident connection with the ANC, which was, after all, a very august uh, institution that had never trafficked in violence, but MK would just be seen as an adjunct. This was not, in fact, the case. Once MK was formed, everybody immediately knew, and Albert Lutuli and Matthews and others were embarrassed at this. Well, South Africa did not transition out of apartheid in the 1960s, as you know, and Nelson Mandela was sent to jail for life, and apartheid South Africa increasingly turned to the issue of keeping people out of the cities and towns unless they were at work. And there was no freedom of movement for anyone besides Europeans in South Africa. Men were not permitted to move about without a pass from an employer. Men could only be public servants, we could only be public persons by carrying out their employer's wishes. Police would stop and inspect the papers of any black person in the city at any time, like a traffic stop. Not only was there no freedom of movement, no free employment market, but the distinction between civil and criminal law that we hold did not obtain. So if you were a black mason and a handyman and you violated your rural contract with your employer, say to return to your family to help with the harvest, you could be arrested and put on labor detail in the same district that you lived in, working for the same area as white farmers without pay. South Africa was two societies, one administering the other. One a society, the other the administered, the natives, looking toward a separate future. More and more, Africans nonetheless moved to the cities and formed this critical mass of people who looked and acted like citizens everywhere. And that's just a couple of pictures I have of, uh, of uh, Africans in this context. So it's in this urban context that the ANC began its mass participation phase, especially in the famous defiance campaign of 1952, and then suffered arrests and exonerations, and finally were banned in the 1960s. The ANC, through MK, Mkanto Isizwe, then launched a sabotage campaign, which was intermittently successful, but sometimes almost comically inept. They uh, downed, uh, oh, sorry, here I have a couple of images of um, uh, the, the mi mining headgear in the old Johannesburg, where you see the huge mining dumps of discarded uh, uh, rock leavings, tailings in the background, and a mining official and a general store on the mines, and an urban scene uh, also. This, uh, I believe, is a, a David Goldbrick photograph. Um, this is what I wanted to show you, this, this, uh, uh, this, this bit of, uh, of dynamite here, and this, this uh, downed pylon uh, under a power line. About 150 incidents were reported, maybe a bit more, with only a few handfuls of convictions until the major trial that sentenced Mandela, the Ravonia trial in 1963 and 1964. In this period, ordinary people did extraordinary things. They burnt sugarcane crops, they 
blew up pylons, they detonated train tracks. All this, the deadly violence that uh, came about with, uh, with, with some uh, campaigns that were not controlled with the ANC, and this sabotage formed the context for Mandela's imprisonment and his sentencing and imprisonment. Well, the locus of protest shifted to the urban areas, and this was genuine. And I've already mentioned the black consciousness movement. And I should also mention the heroic Soweto uprising of 1976. This uprising, we now understand, was uh, because the school board had uh, agreed with the increased provision of schooling for children, but in recompense, the conservatives demanded that a law be enforced that said that Afrikaans be used to instruct those students through high school. And when those students marched in protest, they were fired on. And thousands of young people fled South Africa and went to training camps in the frontline states or further afield. And in at least one case, dozens of young people, about 14, 15, 16 years old, led to a mass circumcision ceremony in an ANC camp to bring them into manhood as ranked allies in the traditional way. None of these mobilizations were tribal. All of them intersected with popular politics, continuing the countryside from a political past that had deep roots. They were traditional in a sense, but they were not tribal. Gradually, in the 70s and 80s, with more ANC attacks, and then the uprisings of young men in the cities, the liberation of whole neighborhoods, Alexandra Township, for instance, where boulevards that were wide enough to accommodate a mi military vehicle making a U-turn were now renamed after prominent communists and other leaders in the, Af in the, the uh, struggles past. And at some point, the change came. It became possible to guarantee enough capital control by existing elites after a transition that negotiations were undertaken. I used to get the African National Congress magazine, Sechaba, which was always clear that the mines would be nationalized in addition to the people's land. But after 1986, despite the state of emergency and the ugliness of incipient civil war, an outline became visible. There would be no seizure of production in South Africa. There would be no nationalization of the mines. But in no case can it be construed that a tribal past gave way to a political one as African politics, in fact, began a long time before. So it cannot be that the ANC initiated a turn away from the tribal and toward the national in the discourse of popular opposition. If the world's sympathy rests with the ANC because they are seen as anchoring African people in a post-tribal political culture, let me say that those are not good grounds. Because, in fact, for hundreds of years, people's popular politics themselves enclosed a non-ethnic tradition of alliance, ancestry, and interaction, involving small-scale skirmishes and warfare, but no overarching authority, save the agreement that chiefs did not ordinarily kill each other. So now, what kind of Africa is bid to return to us? Now, this is a more difficult question. I've talked about alliances of young people and generations and it does strike me that there are some things that are reminiscent of that history. For instance, Julius Malema, the Youth League African National Congress leader, recently flew off the handle when, after using the word Santon as an expletive, Santon being the residence of Johannesburg's well-heeled population, and especially whites, um, a white reporter asked Julius Malema, but don't you live in Santon? Indeed, he does. Malema's response was to threaten the reporter with bodily ejection from the meeting and to say over and over again, this is a revolutionary building. The young men or youngish men, he's actually not that young, in alliance with one another, cajoling or threatening their elders into movement in their interest, yes, that is a traditional part of African politics in South Africa. The infusion of Christian imagery in politics and the vitality of Christian organizations, yes, that is a part of traditional politics in South Africa. The backdating and essentializing of alliances made for strategic or profitable reasons, 
That is also a part of traditional politics in South Africa. And lastly, exalting and magnifying the power of the person in the leadership position, the chief or the ruler or a concept, that is also a political tradition. So one can note that uh, uh, the, re the refusal to, to judge those who alleviated an intolerable condition can be seen with both South Africa and Rwanda, President Kagame's government and post-1994 Rwanda. But if we only judge the RPF and the ANC governments in comparison to what came before, well, they're bound to pass muster, aren't they? <laughs> I mean, after all, in comparison to apartheid and genocide, many governments look just great. South Africa today continues to look good when compared to apartheid or to simple barbaric tribal identifications. But those are myths, and this is not a high enough standard. So to return for a last moment to soon-to-be President Mandela's maiden speech, by bridging these two constituencies' eras and ideas of power and return, in that one moment, Mandela, in a sense, uttered a hope to unify a century of the African National Congress, the 1940s and 1950s, 1960s, 70s, and 80s, with the activity of young lions who wanted power now. And in so doing, he exerted his moral authority and asked that Africa return to us. And the us here, I think, is the last point that I would make that I hadn't alluded to. The us being a wide and embracing us, not a racially or ethnically uh, limited one, not even one limited to Africans, but an us meaning everybody in South Africa who had a tradition of self-government government and self-rule. Thank you very much. Uh, Paul, can I just open the discussion? Can I pick you up on your concluding point that uh, there were a lot of people in South Africa who had traditions of self-government and so on. Could you just briefly tell us, I say briefly because it's a subject for a different lecture, uh, how this would have looked from the vantage point of the Afrikaner government, for example, de Klerk? Um, uh, uh, de Klerk uh, uh, viewed Africans as belonging to tribes. Um, this uh, was the way African politics was represented, certainly from the early 19th century, which is, uh, which is why I have an interpretation which is different from that. Um, uh, I, I think that uh, uh, de Klerk was, of course, faced with uh, the problem in Natal of the uh, assertion of chiefly prerogative that went along with the idea of Zuluness under um, Chief Mangasutu Butelezi. And, uh, uh, you know, it was, it was widely understood that this was a serious challenge and a serious threat. Uh, um, and, and so I think that probably typified in his view uh, what tribal Africa had to offer. The framework was the ANC was modern, new, uh, secular nationalist movement that was going to overturn the prior condition, which was apartheid, and then before that, tribal rule. Uh, as a sort of unthought customary uh, affiliation that Budalese tried, um, tried to use in his favor, with some success and, and, and some failure. Thank you for that. Thank you. Floor is open for comments and Questions? Yeah, let's go. Yeah. Hold on for the microphone. What do you think of the argument that tribalism and, in fact, even blackness is or has been an invention by Europeans? And, and uh, how, how do we explain that, you know, there are so many different attitudes of different Europeans towards uh, black Africans? I mean, you go to Portuguese, uh, former Portuguese colonies, where there have been, from the very beginning, uh, uh, a mixing of, of the races uh, and also of religions. Just last year I came across a situation in Sao Tome where there are 2,000, the locals say, here are 2,000 Jews, black Jews, um, who were expelled from Portugal and who married um, women who came in from the Congos as, as slaves. 
uh, 200 years ago. There's no synagogue left, <laughs> but people recognize each other by their names, and they get along with each other, former slaves and Jews and Christians and, and what have you. And then you have the South African situation. So how much is all this about the invention, right. and, and why are there differences between different Europeans vis-a-vis -vis the blacks? Well, first of all, thank you, thank you for the question. It's a good question. I think it's important to realize, first of all, that tribalism and blackness are, uh, are two different things, at least in the sense that I'm, uh, that I'm speaking. But it's also important to realize that the, the, the vocabulary of tribalism was, in fact, used by black people and Africans. And I, can, uh, uh, I could share with you that, that in, in my analysis uh, in my book, I date the actual advent of tribalism to the late 19th century, the mid to late 19th century. In other words, it's when people lose their access to the land, when chiefship and alliances lose their ability to settle people, to control production on the land. That's when tribalism becomes a working concept, because that's when people start identifying themselves by bodily index to an agreed upon identity that does not have roots in actual politics. And this is something that goes along with the, uh, uh, the dispossession of, of people from the land. There's a, a long process that extends from the 1840s and 50s on up through the 1890s and then uh, um, uh, 1913. One of the problems in the attempt to resettle Africans on the land now is that the people in charge of this policy believe in the tribal model. So the uh, idea is to go back no further than 1913. The 1913 Native Land Act dispossessed a lot of people in South Africa who hadn't already lost their land before then, but to try to find what tribes or tribal segments have rights to the land. And this always gets uh, uh, botched up because it becomes an anachronistic exercise. It's simply a paradigm that if you push back in time to the point where people have actual rights, the paradigm stops being effective and useful because people are negotiating in the real world and changing their status. Yep. Sonia? <clears throat> This is a question that Charlie Mayer might ask, but, uh, but let me anticipate it. Uh, aren't all, aren't all, uh, <laughs> let me, may I presume, um, aren't all attachments to the land invented? I mean, you say, you know, you, I, what you're suggesting, what you just suggested in your answer that there was this kind of pre-tribal pre attachment to the land that oh, was yeah. somehow this er thing, and how was that any more natural than, it's than not, tribalism? It's just not tribal. In other words, the, the, the institution of chiefship and alliances um, trumped tribalism. People might view themselves as different ethnically if they were joining an area or coming from an area and encountering different people, but if they all were part of the same hierarchical political formation, um, then those, eth those ethnic divisions were, were dissolved, in fact, by the political process in South Africa's long history. So what, 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 I, what, what I'm trying to emphasize here is it, it's only the idea of a pre-existing permanent kind of difference. That comes about when people are being administered by authority that they are not vested in, by an external top-down authority that's administering them. Then you, then you can speak of tribalism not just in the minds of Europeans, but also in the minds and the, the speech of Africans who want to get along and, and get ahead in the system as it actually exists. Um, but, but before then, if one pushes it to, to back to the level where people actually lived in the landed interlocked formations that they lived on on the ground, tribe would be an insignificant way to understand people's actual organization with regard to each other. Affiliation to a chief, Sonia. Affiliation to a chief, okay? which could be changed. That's why I went into this idea about the Paiti Kingdom, incorporating different people in Basutu. It's not like there are other tribes there that are real and are trumped either. The other tribes that one might imagine is pre-existing are simply other bypassed affiliations to an ancestor that are political in nature. Um, and there's a, a lot of movement in the 19th century. So, so it's, it's not like if you went back before 1913, you'd find a, a, a tribal Valhalla and you'd be able to assign people permanent identities and everything would work out. It wouldn't. Charlie? Well, I guess uh, Sonia didn't quite anticipate my question, but she anticipated a, uh, 
uh, something similar and, and, and to a degree genuine puzzlement. I mean, it's this prehistory, this pre-alienation of the land, which I know nothing about in southern Africa. My sense is uh, a lot of these people are migrants of the 19th century or earlier, obviously, or moving, as you suggest. So, but if... How, I mean, where does, is there a sort of founding moment for any of this affiliation, you know, a type of uh, social uh, contract, so to speak, that comes where you say, I am affiliated with a chief, and how does it arise? And if you're thinking comparatively, I, 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 wh how would you, wh what's different than if you come, if you, you know, when Lewis and Clark go to the Western territories and they see people who identify themselves as, what they will call tribes or maybe nations or whatever. I mean, how does this stack up comparatively if we were trying to think about a, 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 a sort of, a, let's say, a, a not a very useful concept of tribalism or peoplehood or uh, confederation where, uh, you know, with other places where, where it's also used, whether in the uh, Central Asia or the, the uh, American, uh, you know, Northwest or, or whatever. I'm, I'm, uh, well, um, it's it's a good question, but but let me let me go back for a moment to the idea of a founding moment. Um, as I think that that's uh, uh, that's something I can speak to. Um, although the the wider context, just to say a word about that, is is in fact to deethnicize modes of belonging to understand in, in terms of what people's actual options and affiliations were, what they were. In Southern Africa, you've got the S group as a single subdivision of Bantu speech, which covers a huge area in, in Southern Africa. It's quite different from the situation, for instance, with the Plains Indians and so on, where there was myriad languages and you didn't have anything like that. But for founding moments, take Basutu. Mashwe is, uh, you know, studied today as, a, oh, he's the leader of, uh, the founder of Lesotho. That's a lot of nonsense. Before Lesotho was an independent country, Lesotho was a massive uh, mobilization of landed farmers in South Africa that had to be defeated and, and cut down to size. So there were tons of people who identified themselves as Basotho who settled in the best farmlands in the middle of South Africa. It was only when the Boers came and conquered that territory and turned it into the Orange Free State and said, these people can no longer have any contact with the chiefship. We're not permitting it, right? that they recognized those people who no longer had contact with the chiefship but who lived on their white farms as Basutu anyway. And a new identity was born. The idea of being a loyal Basutu, colonially loyal Basutu or Musutu, right, hadn't existed before. At that moment, one can talk about the beginning of tribal Basutuness. You see what I'm getting at? But before no, I, that, I, one can't. I right? saw what you're getting at. I just was trying to be interested in the history before that. I mean, how wide a sense of affiliation could exist in these pre-confiscatory, uh, pre uh, you know, eras? Or very, very wide, uh, but they could be overlapping. So, for instance, uh, the, the uh, crocodile affiliation was uh, uh, threaded through as like a, a marbling in meat throughout uh, all of the chiefdoms in the middle of the high felt. So you could be ranked in a, a particular association and belong to a, a chiefdom that might have violated that rankings. So this was a negotiation on the ground. You had large political affiliations. The, the big shapes that I showed of, of uh, Bahrutsi and Barlong perhaps refer to long gone pre-colonial kingdoms of the 18th century or before, but we don't, we don't have any proof, of course, because all we have to go on are how people talk now, what, the, what, what their language and words are for things, what the archaeology is, what the oral tradition is, none of which is absolutely certain. Can I ask one follow-up? And that is, at this, I sort of think of this moment, uh, which is so, so decisive for you, where land is expropriated or taken over, people move in, and is the, who, um, is it the, uh, the uh, Africans, the indigenous people, peoples uh, who imagine themselves as tribes, or is it the whites who are doing the uh, confiscation who are imagining them as tribes, or are these processes running together? 
Well, they're running together, but the first attempts to um, understand people in a coherent way as tribes and to enumerate what those tribes are, um, there are a lot of lists that get thrown up in the 19th century and they disagree with each other. But as people are photographed and measured and cataloged, very often in places where different people get together, like work sites or white farms, because then you have a lot of different people, then there's this idea that you can categorize everybody as essentially belonging to this or that tribe. So in a sense, the idea of tribalism is born when people no longer live together in coherent political formations and no longer have a, a, a direct vested connection with the authority that rules them. At that point in time, people start adopting that mode of discourse. People I identify themselves as loyal Basutu. It, it makes sense to, if the, the powers that be require it. And of course, in apartheid, that was uh, even more so the case. Thank you. Yeah, Andrew. Thanks for the talk, Paul. The, um, it seems that there's, you know, there are two parts to the story. It's a story about, I mean, to see it as a story about politicization and depoliticization. And to say the initial moment of tribalization is a point at which, is, is, is an attempt by the white rulers to depoliticize people, to take them out of a situation in which identity can be multiple and fluid and politics is constantly negotiated into one in which an individual is fixed in a, in a tribal identity, which is essentially a biological identity and one that has no, 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 no political head. Say. And that, that, that makes a lot of sense. But then it also seems there's another moment where then those, that kind of tribal, that tribalized uh, anti-politics becomes a politics in itself. And I have, I think you, you're suggesting in your talk and, and in and your other work that there's something defective about that kind of politics, that the old kind of politics is better. And I share that sense too, but I, I can't explicate why. But I wonder if you could talk about the, the difference in, is, I mean, why that's a different, qualitatively different type of politics, one based on, on the fixity of tribe versus the fluidity and multiplicity of, of the, the pre-tribal uh, history that you're talking about. Thanks for that, Andrew. Well, I think I can answer that pretty easily. My reasons are that the track record of tribal organization is so poor. And when you have a, a, a unitary state, you end up having um, a set of patron-client relations that are based in regions where there's kind of a gatekeeper function and it's our time to eat kind of situation with, with different tribes. And, and I think that the point is that, 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 and some people have written that this is a worry that uh, uh, perhaps that's, that's coming for South Africa like for other places. And, and I hope it's not, and I don't think it is. I don't think it is for reasons that I've given. I hope it's not, because I think if South Africans draw on their real political heritage, which is much more fluid than that, and does have features that are disquieting, no doubt, but nonetheless is not a tribal heritage, then I think that there'll be a better future for South Africa. So, so there's a, uh, you know, I'm exhorting as well as, as well as describing. And I think ultimately, I mean, I, I, I don't want to give short shrift to what you're saying. The idea of a bodily identified form of belonging, um, it's, it's, it's a bit of nothingness, you know, it's, it's in a sense, it's like nationalism. I mean, it doesn't have any content. It can be used in any direction and, um, and misused um, and can simply accelerate and make more extreme political situations. So I, I, I don't see it as a positive thing. It's true. Mm -hmm. Hold on. I'm wondering if you could talk about um, some of the economic changes that we associate with modernity and market capitalism, um, and how, in what ways it strengthens the tribal identities and what ways it might weaken it, and how, how you see that perhaps playing out at the present moment. Well, interestingly enough, not all forms of communal land tenure died in South Africa. I mean, I, recently, I was just reading about the area around Walkerstrom. Uh, uh, apparently, for some reason, this is one of the only places where there's a town and the, the land surrounding the town are still common. It's we're never, we're never divided. Um, uh, so there are situations like that. But overwhelmingly in South Africa now, for productive farms, you've got a private land tenure system. And 
I, I think that, that that could certainly be overlaid with a, a, a lot of patriarchal structures that we don't understand on the ground or, or, or that could be variably described as based in the family or, or the sort of the, the false family of the white landlord and, and uh, uh, Africans working under them because land redistribution has not gone very far in South Africa right now. Um, uh, but but I would I would say that the uh, the change was that when production was part of the overall situation of politics, and you know, for instance, people in the who wanted to belong to the Paty Kingdom and raise their standing would go to work on the mines and come back and buy a gun and some cattle, and uh, have a homestead, and uh, that would strengthen the Paty Kingdom. The same could be said for the Zulu. The same could be said for other. Uh, other kingdoms. Now, that's obviously not true. I mean, whatever whatever tribe means now, it's been reduced. And the African National Congress has been clear about this. The African National Congress has not wanted to vest so-called traditional rulers with real authority. It's instead, it's wanted to uh, have traditional rulers uh, do what what really could be considered tribal things. You know, um, so administrative authority of uh, collecting firewood, sanitation, uh, that kind of thing. Very minor. Um, uh, judicial functions, uh, no, nothing real. Um, anything real, anything having to do with real allocation of, of wealth or uh, adjudication is should be done by people connected more strongly to the African National Congress. And this is there's been some conflict over this. Um, and it, it, the, the reason I'm hesitant here is that the issue is confused because today you'll find people saying, well, the tribal chief should have more power, right? The language that people use does not accord with the language that I'm presenting here. And that's part of the story. I mean, of course, people do use the language of tribes. I belong to this tribe, you belong to that tribe, where it's uh, relevant in, in, uh, in whatever situation they find themselves in. That doesn't mean that I haven't you know, made any point about, about how those affiliations uh, develop. It just means that they shouldn't be historicized without any thought to what actually came before. So I don't know if I've really answered your question or not. I suspect I haven't fully, but... Um, I mean, market capitalism can be extremely destabilizing and destroy a lot of the institutions upon which... Okay, and I see where you're going. Right. The, whether you see that operating in a... a, a how that's... No, actually not. I mean, you know, the, the, the Africans were extremely good at outproducing uh, white farmers and imported plows and uh, uh, were, you know, the, the, what became Lesotho was the grain basket, the Caldon Valley, where, where uh, uh, Boris took a lot of land, was, was the wheat grain basket for, for South Africa. So there were, there were ways to feed the, the destabilizing effects of, of market capitalism into political formation that were very real. It was only extra market influences that changed that, the taking of land, the reduction of people to um, sharecroppers, um, where all of a sudden you'd be farming on land that your grandfathers uh, and, and grandmothers uh, farmed on, but now you'd have to give half of what you produce to the white farmer in order to be able to stay there. Um, that was the first big change. The second big change that you hear much more about is the 20th century change where sharecropping was made illegal. So there's the, the two-pronged dispossession of people. First, the creation of sharecroppers on their land, which was a 19th century phenomenon. Then, the elimination of sharecropping and the decree that people essentially had to be paid in one way or another to, to uh, um, to professionalize and, and, and increase production on farms, to force white farmers to, uh, to increase production, capitalize. Uh, you, you raised uh, two triangles, and one of them was Christian. Uh, I was wondering what effect that um, the brand of Christianity that these uh, black indigenous South Africans uh, had on, on their concept of tribalism. Uh, certainly the, the white tribes and the colored tribes were divergent. Uh, the uh, Dutch Reformed Church and the Anglican Church and the Hindu faith were quite different. Were, they, were the blacks all one homogenous Christian group? Thank you for that question. Um, no, no, they weren't. But um, it's, it's also the case that the distinguishing of colored from uh, Bantu speaker or black is also a process that unfolds in the 19th century and is not as clear as one might think. 
in the constitution of who got to be called colored and who did not. Um, and in, in looking at uh, uh, Christianity, there are a lot of Christian movements in, in 19th and 20th century Southern Africa, and some of them deliberately try to cross that um, boundary. Um, one I discuss uh, in my book is a Griqua movement of the 1920s and 1930s, in which they try to fill their, their church pews, it's a Christian movement as well as a political movement, with Africans. And they say several times to the police, stop telling us that the Baralong and Batlaping are not uh, Griqua. They are Griqua. They're Griqua because they're, they're worshiping with us right here. So they're, 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 they're crossing that colored black divide there. Um, I think the, the point about Christianity, though, is, is that because Christianity so thoroughly took over the terminology and understanding that inhabited political formations, Christianity is still... Uh, a repository of political ambition in South Africa today. It's just that it's been divested of direct action against the state. Um, so occasionally, uh, Christian movements would threaten to cross that boundary and take direct action against the state. And occasionally, Communist Party members would suddenly sound like evangelical preachers um, and use Christian language because in South Africa, Christianity was permitted to persist as a way of, of, uh, of people's understanding of their own rankings and association with some higher purpose. And that continued on, whereas their political organization in the mode that I've been depicting was, was stamped out. It was essentially forbidden, um, not for, not. Uh, uh, not always successfully, but the, the rules were on the books from 1914 and then reestablished in 1927. Africans could not get together in, in political assemblies, were not permitted to, um, unless they were discussing tribal affairs, right, or religious worship, one or the other. So those had to be policed and monitored, meaning they could, they could uh, uh, get together in a, a rural area and discuss those things that were considered appropriately tribal, but not things that were not, basically. Sonia. I'm, I, as this discussion has moved along, and actually going back to your original talk, I'm thinking that tribal, tribalization, not just tribalism, but tribalization, the imposition of this category on, on political life, has a transnational history. Um, and Charlie's, point, Charlie's reference to what went on in the U.S. and, um, and your, com your comparison with Rwanda. And I'm wondering to what extent, you know, what, how much exchange was there? How much circulation was there of this idea of tribalization? And, and uh, you know, did the Dutch use the same kind of terminology in their other, in, in, in Indonesia and other, you know, parts of their colonial world? Um, when you were talking about how people would be measured and sort of ident given this ethnic identity, I mean, that smacks very much of 19th century. Right, late 19th century. Yeah, racialization and so forth. So I just wonder, I mean, have you thought about that at all? Does that make any sense to think about? Or, or maybe a broader question is, does tribalism have a national, transnational history? I'm, 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 I'm struggling to think of a way to answer the question. I mean, the, the Every single administer of authority wanted to discover, wanted to discover homogenous groups of people where there'd be a natural leader, there'd be a person to deal with, and uh, whatever was promulgated would be understood by everybody. This was incredibly useful. What's useful is what um, imperializing powers seem to see very often, and there are limits. You could be brought up hard against reality uh, sometimes. but. Uh, overall, that this was the most effective way to be, and you know, people would fall into line or not. There was often a lot of misunderstandings. Uh, you know, we don't understand why why people are behaving like this. Why don't they do X, Y, and Z? Well, the reason is because they're not actually a tribe, and they refuse to behave like one. That was fairly common, um, but you know, that that could all be uh, uh, washed away when you you know you encountered the next group. This, this mode of consciousness, I, I must say, is, is, is even in uh, uh, President Nelson Mandela's uh, own uh, memoirs. 
he talks about the tribes that made up his own people and so on. And, and uh, a, a lot of what he says is a kind of, a, a, it's a Fargo of, uh, of myth and uh, schoolboy teaching that, that he had uh, when he was young. So the point is that the, the idea that Africans fell into tribes was so basic that it just, it was difficult to think your way out of or question in any way because it was ultimately useful. I mean, it's almost orientalizing. It's primitizing people because what's the better way is to be a na is to be nationalist uh, to be a nation, right? I mean, especially in the 19th century when nationhood is the big is the big enchilada. It's the big goal. So, so any, anybody who's below the, excuse my language, but I mean, it, it, you know, anything that's below that or sort of resistant to it, or is, is unmodern. It's it's atavistic. It's you know, I mean, so so imposing that category on people is to Pre pre present them as being unready for, for self-rule, un unready for, Still. yeah, and yeah. Tribe. Yeah. 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 yeah, and tribalism, to be, tri to be tribal is to be atavistic, is to be overly ethnic, is to, be, yeah, pre -political. It's not yeah. to have control over the state. I, I would just add that as a basic element to it. It, it means that people are within a larger field where other people are in charge of that larger field. It seems to me to be often when, when tribes get mentioned and discussed and talked about. <laughs> We're almost out of time, and suddenly the hands fly up. But why don't we take a, a, a few um, Somebody down there, yeah, right? questions uh, down there. And there's uh, Arnita, I think, as well. Very simple question. You mentioned that South Africa is largely Bantu. What fraction? Is it 90 percent, 95 percent? And, uh, and, and related, how close is, is Bantu to the other African languages? There are substantial difference. Bantu languages are spoken uh, throughout sub-Saharan Africa, not everywhere, but but in uh, large parts of the of the continent, and in in South Africa, there's been some population changes recently. The figure used to be 72 percent Bantu speaking. I don't like that because people can speak second and third languages, and that's really not. It's a racial category masquerading as a linguistic one, because the, the the rest of the of the percentage would be made up by so-called coloreds, Indians, and whites, and other uh, people of other uh, races. Um, but, but as I said, those those divisions. You know, and Bantu languages are closely related to other Niger-Congo languages, um, but uh, well, not closely. They're they're in the same general category as other West African Niger-Congo languages, but but uh, not closely related to um, other African languages, uh, uh, Semitic languages, and so on. In in Southern Africa, if you if you grew up speaking a, a a Bantu language spoken anywhere south of the Zambezi, within a few weeks of living in another place, you'd be able to get around. Let me put it that way. It's like maybe Italian, Portuguese, and French kind of thing. I've just talk? been sitting here thinking, um, how did you do your research? What the, when I think of what sources you might have used, um, it begins to get um, really sort of a stupendous array of possibilities. So I, I just like a few words about, you know, what mm. what did you look at? Who did you talk to? What sort of? Well, thank uh, you. Can, can I just oh, pile yes, on to that? Of course, please. Um, uh, you mentioned, you alluded to the state of the ANC archives. If you could talk to oh, that. Yeah. yeah, that's a bad okay. story. <clears throat> um, well, my, my sources are, are virtually anything because uh, um, so all oral traditions that had been collected by early ethnographers, I read through, many of them very boring genealogical uh, lists and so on. I also did uh, research in Setswana, which I learned and lived in uh, uh, several places in Botswana, uh, which is connected historically to the kings of South Africa. And so I got a, I got a feel for how people organized themselves there firsthand. Um, the, there's also just knowing the language uh, enough to work in it and also having taken Zulu, I, I was able to make connections between words and use um, what words were for things in reconstructing the past. Not, not particularly well, but in the same line as my previous mentor, Jan Vencina, pioneered in using um, vocabularies 
compare vocabularies and get at word roots and find out how people spoke in the past. Um, then there's archaeology, a lot of new archaeology recently in, in, in Southern Africa and in South Africa. Um, and um, early uh, traveler's accounts, any kind of traveler's accounts uh, that, that were out there, I, I read and, and, and used those as well. Missionaries' accounts, yeah, missionaries uh, wrote a lot about people in, in depth, and so their accounts are very useful. Um, and then, you know, I, I take colonial records. Uh, colonial records, sure, definitely colonial records that I access in South Africa. I didn't go to Kew in, in London. Um, but I'm in good company. Terence Ranger tells me he's never been to Kew in London either, so I feel a little better. But I take it all the way up to the 20th century, so I also use more more recent um, accounts and, and uh, administrative records from South Africa and stuff. In answer to, to your question, Christian, um, and that's a sad story, but... Uh, the archivist in the Maibui archives in, in Fort Hare was fired when uh, they uh, opened the records in this big ceremony. And some reporter found um, some sheet of paper that had uh, Nelson Mandela making some comment in the past about the ANC that was not 100 percent flattering. And the African National Congress came and confiscated the document and a, a ton of other records and fired the archivist. Um, they then went and, and did this in, in other centers, too. Uh, the African National Congress, one has to remember, um, was a movement before it was a party. Um, secrecy was paramount to it. Um, it still makes decisions behind closed doors. And uh, this is to be regretted. Uh, but uh, that, that's what's been happening in South Africa recently. So. Very good. Maybe just in, in closing, what's been the reaction in South Africa to your, your book, your argument, your exhortation? <clears throat> it's been, um, it's a little early. As you know, when, you know, a book comes out in, in November, uh, it came out in November 2010, there's, there's a bit of a lag time before you have real, uh, real response and stuff. Certainly in print, it's, it's about a year. But I, I, when I've, I've given talks there, I, I found that there's appreciation for it. I'm building on other scholars' work. It's not, this isn't something dramatically new. It's something that takes the way Africanists look at African political organization and applies it to South African history, where South Africanist historians might be really great, but they haven't done this kind of thing in, the, in this way. So there were a, a number of people who, who, were, who were pleased and nodded their heads. I, I will say that, that my one uh, negative comment was I wrote a mail and guard Guardian article, and one of the comments in the Mail and Guardian article said, this American comes in and he says that there's no such thing as tribes. Really? There's no colorful Indibele tribesmen? Well, this is news to, we South Af to us South Africans, you know. And, and uh, you know, well, I thought, well, okay. But in fact, that's not really what I'm saying. I'm, I'm historicizing the production of tribal identity. I'm not denying that it existed. So, so overall, it's been positive. We'll see. Very good. We'll see. Well, thank you so much, Paul. I think this was an absolutely fascinating talk and afternoon. Thank, thank you. you for that. Let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> Let me again, on behalf of my co-chair, Roger Lewis, and the National History Center as well, thank all of you for coming and invite you to uh, some nibbles and a little bit of wine uh, outside uh, to continue the conversation more informally. Thanks a lot. We'll, we'll resume. Monday after Labor Day. And thank you again, Paul. Thank you. Paul, oh, thank you. That's great. That's great. Very sweeping, comprehensible.